and keeping inspectors from doing their jobs. Meanwhile, here at home, the Comey tour continues as President Trump gets ready for a big meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister. And that's all just at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm Bill Hammer. Good morning at home, everybody, live inside of America's Newsroom. How you doing? Nice to Good see you, Good morning, Sandra. Bill. You? Only 9 o'clock in the morning. A lot yeah. changing. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith, the president, making some news while down in Mar-a-Lago. The White House now saying Mr. Trump could be considering a meeting with Vladimir Putin, while the president himself touted the success of those weekend airstrikes you know with way over a hundred missiles shot in they didn't shoot one down the equipment didn't work too well their equipment and uh, they didn't shoot one you know you heard oh they shot 40 down then they shot 15 down they watched then I call I said did they no sir every single one hit its target think of that how genius not one was shot so we begin this hour, live Team Fox coverage, Kevin Cork traveling to the president in Florida. But we begin with Mike Tobin, live in Jerusalem, where only moments ago, state television in Syria says inspectors may have entered the town in question. Mike, hello to you. Hello there, Bill. And that is a big development. However, the uh, Russian and Syrian forces have had control of that town of Duma really since last Thursday. So uh, they're giving the, uh, the skeptics a lot to work with in terms of uh, uh, the ability of the, uh, the Russians or the Syrians to clean up the site and uh, produce the result that they want. Of course, they have been claiming all along that the chemical attack uh, was all, wasn't real, and they uh, later went on to say it was staged by that uh, first responder group called the White Helmets. So it is a development the, uh, that the Inspectors from the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons have been in that town, but the uh, skeptics are going to have a lot to work with. Now I want to make a right turn because there's some uh, big development coming out of Israel now. Israel's making a statement that they know where Iran is setting up bases inside of Syria. Israel took an unusual step today of releasing satellite images of Iranian locations inside of Syria. The first location we can show you, according to an Israeli source, shows Iranian forces basing at the Seikal airport inside of Syria. A the second image shows what Israel says is an Iranian drone at the Deir Azur airport in East Syria. Israel went as far as to release pictures of the Mehrabad airport in Tehran because according to this source, this is the airport from which Iran is flying weapons and personnel into Syria. Now, According to this Israeli source, oftentimes the flight is disguised as a civilian flight. Israel also took the step of releasing the image of Haji Zada, the Air Force commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. The message here is that he is a potential target if things escalate. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said publicly on a number of occasions that uh, Israel will not tolerate Iran establishing forward bases inside of Syria. Thank Bill? you, Mike. A lot to cover there. Mike Tobin live in our Middle East Bureau there in Jerusalem. Thank you, Sandra. And as we mentioned, President Trump is at Mar-a-Lago weighing plans for new sanctions on Russia, plus a possible meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Later today, he'll sit down with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Kevin Cork is live in West Palm Beach, Florida for us this morning. Kevin, what's the White House saying about the apparent gap between what Nikki Haley said about sanctions and, and what the White House is saying? Hey there, Sandra, you're right. They, they talked about the gap throughout the day yesterday in social media, but the White House would argue there is no gap. Simply because there hasn't been a formal announcement and there was no Monday rollout doesn't mean that something couldn't be on the way. In fact, Sarah Sanders has been talking about this. Let me show you just a bit of what she had to say. She said, listen, there are considerations. Uh, additional sanctions are underway, and that's an important distinction to make. She also said the president has been clear. Uh, he's going to be tough on Russia, but at the same time, he'd still like to have a a good relationship with them. A relationship, I think it's fair to say, that's increasingly strained because of the Kremlin support of the Assad regime, which has been accused, as you know, of using banned chemical weapons on their own people. Russia promising chaos if there are more uh, U.S. actions against them, in particular airstrikes. Uh, as for a possible meeting, the Kremlin said there has been a discussion between the U.S. and Russia about a possible meeting between the two leaders, but that could certainly change at a moment's notice, Sandra. Kevin, meanwhile, the president set to meet his Japanese counterpart, Shinzo Abe, for a two-day yeah. summit. A lot riding on this meeting. Yeah. What is the agenda there? Well, clearly, they're going to talk a great deal about North Korea, right? But I think there is also increasing concern uh, that there may be a deal made between the U.S. and maybe North Korea down the line 
that doesn't do enough to address short-range missiles. That's one of the major concerns for the Japanese. But clearly we're talking about a relationship between two men that certainly have gotten along uh, for some time. The president and Shinzo Abe, in fact, uh, met not only here in Mar-a-Lago last year, the two men also met over in Japan. Let me take you to Twitter. The president saying this not long ago. I'm in Florida looking forward to my meeting with Prime Minister Abe of Japan, working on trade and military security. Now, it is also fair to say that despite the great relationship the two men have had, uh, this two-day get-together is coming amid concerns that the president might try to link uh, North Korean nukes and economic concerns, Sandra, in order to score more concessions that would favor the United States. Our country has been taken advantage of for many, many years. Japan and South Korea, so many countries. But with China, we're at $375 billion trade deficit. So we started a process, and we'll see how it ends up. But we're going to win. We lost years ago by presidents and others allowing this to happen. They should have never allowed it to happen. Okay, so there you hear it. It's not just about regional security. It's also about access to markets and economic cooperation. Part of a big couple of days here, including a dinner tonight with the first ladies of both countries. Sandra? All this talk of the economy. Uh, we are going to be watching those markets when they open about 24 minutes from now. Kevin Cork, thank you. Yep. Another big story this morning now. Congressional deadline has come and gone for the Justice Department to turn over memos written by the former FBI Director James Comey. Those memos detail his conversations and encounters with President Trump. The request came last week from the heads of three House committees who argued they have the right to view the documents in unredacted form. So far, it's a no-go. Hugo Gurdon, editorial director for the Washington Examiner. Hugo, good morning to you. Welcome back to our program. Thank Some reporters me. have seen the memos. Makes sense for Congress to see them too. What's the holdup? What would explain that? Well, the, the, the uh, DOJ and the FBI are treating these memos as though they were classified. They're not classified. As you say, a friend, uh, a professor at Columbia University, who's a friend of uh, James Comey's, has seen them. He passed them to the New York Times. The New York Times has reported on them. So there's absolutely no reason. In fact, it's an outrage that Congress, which has a constitutional duty of oversight over the executive, uh, has not seen them. You know, the, the, the kind of pompous title of uh, James Comey's book is A Higher Loyalty, and he's implying that somehow, you know, he's got a higher loyalty than to the president. The highest loyalty seems to be to his bank account. He's out there selling and talking, uh, talking up his book, giving details to everybody. The one people, the one place he won't give details is to Congress. Well, underline that point. He leaked the memo in the first place. Reporters from the Times have seen them. Now, I, I, I think we know what James Comey has concluded. If you watch the entire interview, right, from Sunday night, um, he said it himself. There's no proof of collusion that he has. Uh, right. There's no proof of the dossier that he has. There's right. no proof that Russia has black man material over the president. Uh, the, the, those are his words. He offered no evidence to rebut any of that, Hugo. Right. There's, there's absolutely nothing new in this uh, other than, you know, the, all of the details about the supposed wrongdoing or alleged wrongdoing or fanciful idea of wrongdoing about Russia collusion, etc., was all already known. So he focused on things like the length of the president's tie and the size of his hands. Uh, you know, he speculated and, and gave his judgment about the moral fitness of the president to be president. I mean, who cares what James Comey thinks about the moral fitness of the president? He was elected by the voters of the country. He won 30 states out of the 50. He is the president, and, 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 and the Congress is the Congress. It has a duty to look at, uh, at to oversight uh, over the executive. And it should be seeing the memos well, that no, James Comey nonetheless, wrote. Nonetheless, the tour continues. He's doing a lot of interviews over the next two weeks, okay? Uh, this yeah. morning on ABC, his second interview with George Stephanopoulos in two days. This was his reaction to the Michael Cohen raid about a week ago of his home and office hotel room here in New York City. Here it is. It shows me he either doesn't know or doesn't care what the rule of law looks like. Nobody broke into anybody's office. It doesn't happen. It's a total distortion of the way things work. Do, it doesn't happen. Um, Paul Manafort may disagree with that when he got the knock on the door at 6 a.m. What is your view? Yeah, well, my, my view is that actually this uh, raid on Michael Cohen's office uh, does pose some serious jeopardy. It's very interesting that we started off with the Russia collusion allegations, and that's fading fast in the rearview mirror. 
Then there's been the suggestion of obstruction of justice in the way that the president spoke to James Comey. But I don't think that many people think that that's going to hold, even though uh, Comey himself says, you know, maybe there was obstruction of justice. It seems to me that there's a very, at the very least plausible deniability about that. And now the resistance to Trump is, 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 has fastened itself onto the idea that a lot is going to be revealed uh, in the raid or by the raid on Michael Cohen's office. That's a different matter. There may be more there, and it has nothing to do with the original source of the investigation. But, you know, there's, there's reason to believe because of who, which lawyer was acting for whom and whether there was, you know, proper behavior by the lawyers, there may be some sort of uh, peril in there. Whether it reaches the president, I don't know. Okay. Hugo, thank you. Hugo Gurdon with Instant Thanks very much. and all that. Uh, I mentioned ABC this morning, Sander, for James Comey. I think he does The View later today, if I have that right. There was an interview last night with NPR, so there's a lot to go over, and we'll show, we shall get to as much as we possibly can. See what we learn. All right. And as James Comey continues that media blitz this week, former FBI agents are coming to criticize the fired FBI director for his comments. Saying they're damaging the agency. More on that in a moment with our panel. Also, a top Republican senator saying that he has evidence that two anti Trump FBI agents still have top level security clearance despite being pulled off critical investigations. That's Senator Rand Paul. He's behind the claim. He will react live. Coming up today. Meanwhile, the war between the White House and California ramping up over sanctuary city laws. Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn is here. She will be weighing in as another California city votes no against the state. I've had crimes committed on my property by an illegal immigrant and he was released. People who come here in the name of being Christians and say kick him out, it's like what Bible are you reading? The problem I faced in late June was that she announced she wouldn't recuse herself without checking with the FBI to see whether we had a view on it but would accept my recommendation. So you have gone to her directly, not wait to be asked. To my boss? Sure. Maybe, uh, but I really don't think so, even in hindsight. Well, this, um, some would say gift, <laughs> is going to keep on giving. Former FBI Director James Comey responding to criticism about the handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation, calling out Loretta Lynch for her decision not to recuse herself. He argues that the entire FBI in a no-win situation, but did it. Marie Harf, former State Department spokesperson and Fox News analyst, and Amos Sneed, former press secretary for Senator Roy Blunt. Good day to both of you. Um, Let's bring up the quote from NPR. Uh, here it is, apparently an interview done last night. I saw this as a 500-year flood, so where is the manual? What do I do? Wow. It's the life of Joe, Marie. <laughs> I mean, it's just all these challenges befallen him, and what's he going to do about it? All of his answers seem to be seem to be in that same vein. Here are these challenges. We've never seen it before. Now, what am I to do? Well, Jim Comey is certainly not a perfect messenger, and there's a lot in his book and, and in his interviews for both Democrats and Republicans not to like. I totally agree, including the sort of sanctimonious tone he often takes. That being said, just because he's not a perfect messenger doesn't mean we shouldn't take what he says seriously, particularly his concerns about why he was fired, about the president's fitness for office. So I think in some ways we have to separate the two because this media blitz that he's going on is, you know, not, I wouldn't say problematic, but it's mixed at best for both Democrats and Republicans. Okay, everything is an attack. Um, Amos, the more he talks, do, do, does he make a better argument or does he look smaller? Well, I, I, Bill, welcome back to the Comey Circus. I think we're on, what, day seven, day eight? I don't know how long we're going to be here. Uh, Probably I think 13 or 14. 13 or 14. We're <laughs> right in the middle. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at how he carried himself before this book tour, that he was above the fray, that he wasn't going to get down in the weeds and play these political games, he's totally shot that. He's been on tour calling the president a mob boss, personal insults. Uh, he's turned himself basically into a political pundit, and I think it lessens his voice 
uh, on the national stage, but I will predict we're going to hear a lot more about this the next uh, few days. Like, we're in the middle. Don't, don't you think it's relevant that he said he never told President Trump that his opposition was funding the dossier? Uh, that, that's kind of a critical thing. I mean, Murray, isn't it relevant that his wife voted for Hillary Clinton? She's on camera saying that, and three or four of his daughters marched on the the the, um, the march in Washington the day after the inauguration. D well, do, do we not do we not think that is significant to understanding the entire context from which he's coming? Look, public servants are allowed to vote, and their families are allowed to vote, and they're allowed uh, to I'm donate money. Uh, no, I want to be clear. So... I'm not suggesting they shouldn't, but <laughs> to understand the entire story, don't you think that context is relevant here? I think there's a lot of things that are relevant here. There's also a lot of things, quite frankly, that aren't relevant. And how Jim Comey handled the Hillary email investigation, which many Democrats are even angrier about after his interviews and some of the things he's admitted, how he felt like he needed to tell the American people that she was under investigation but what didn't feel like he had to tell the American people that Donald Trump was. How he handled a number of things, those are all questions that need to be answered, but the most important questions that will be answered are being tackled by Bob Mueller right now. So while this is an interesting media circus, the book just came out today officially, which is sort of shocking. We've been talking about it already for four or five days. What Bob Mueller is looking at is what matters here, not this media circus that Jim Comey's doing to try to sell books. All right, one last thing. Chris Wecker writes a piece at FoxNews.com, all right? He's a former FBI agent. Here's what he writes. Now his book renews the controversy to the detriment of nearly everyone but Jim Comey, who was clearly out to repair his tarnished reputation and meet out some payback for his dismissal by President Trump. How about that, Amos? <laughs> hey, I, if you look at this, I mean, I think Marie brings up a great point. You know, Democrats blame Comey for Hillary Clinton not winning the White House, and now he's going to go make a fortune selling books to those same Democrats. So I think if you just look at this circus, I mean, who knows where it comes next. Uh, but it is amazing, the, uh, the voice you can find and the courage you can find uh, on a book tour. 500-year flood. Amos, go ponder that, will you? See you, Marie. Talk to you guys real soon. Thanks for Thanks, both of you coming in today. You. you bet. 20 minutes past the hour now. So. Breaking news on Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen. We're now learning a federal judge has said that Cohen's team can review the documents seized by the FBI. We are live with the latest. So here we go, pizza lovers, Domino's, ramping up the food delivery wars. Check it out. At the beach, at the park, or one of 150,000 other outdoor locations, they will bring a hot pie to you. Customers can place orders <laughs> by, by way of Wi-Fi online or the Domino's app. So now you have noticed. It makes sense, but I do yes. feel for the delivery men and women who... I'm gonna have a tough job to do. Can you imagine describing yourself sitting out on the beach and here we are. We find need, me. We need two large pepperonis and um, we we've got the green umbrella. Yeah. Hey, you know what? A pizza on the beach. Right on. There, there's the Domino's below my apartment. But and once every you two frequent? Months, um, once every two months, I cheat a lot. But the fresh pepperoni hot is killer. Can't beat it. Right all right, Fox News alert for you this morning. A federal judge now saying Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, can review the documents seized in those FBI raids at his home, office, and hotel room. However, things could still be much more complicated based on how many documents will be considered privileged. Laura Ingle joins us now to explain it all. Laura? Hi, Sandra. Well, many decisions were made on how to move forward on the issue of attorney-client privilege yesterday, which Michael Cohen and President Trump's legal team are fighting so hard to protect. Cohen's motion to keep investigators from going through the documents and electronics seized last week at his home, office, and hotel room was denied. The judge explained the matter is moot because the evidence is not available to either side yet. Instead, the judge ordered the government to give copies of all the physical and electronic documents to Cohen's attorney so they can flag what they consider privileged information. Then Cohen's team can share that information with the president's team while the judge decides how to make sure items that should be protected aren't disclosed to investigators. Cohen was also asked to reveal his list of legal clients. Cohen's attorneys turned over two names, President Trump, GOP fundraiser Elliot Broidy, but would not name a third. The judge said the request to remain anonymous wasn't enough under the law, which forced them to reveal the name as Sean Hannity. The Fox News host spoke about it on his evening program. Michael Cohn never represented me in any legal matter. I never retained his services. I never received an invoice. I never paid Michael Cohn for legal fees. I did have occasional brief conversations with Michael Cohn. He's a great attorney about legal questions I had, or I was looking for input 
and perspective. Hannity later reiterated his statement on Twitter, emphasizing that his discussions with Cohen never involved any third party. Sandra. Laura, and the adult film actress Stormy Daniels was in the courtroom for all of this, too. Uh, what, what was that like? Well, it was pretty chaotic, to be truthful. Stormy Daniels arrived with a throng of reporters and photographers chasing her into the courthouse. Some people were tripping over each other, actually. Daniels said she has a vested interest to be there after Cohen paid her $130,000 in 2016 and reported hush money for her alleged sexual relationship with Mr. Trump. For years, Mr. Cohen has acted like he is above the law. He has considered himself and openly referred to himself as Mr. Trump's fixer. He's played by a different set of rules, or should we say no rules at all. He has never thought that the little man, or especially women, and even more women like me, matter. That ends now. So the next court proceeding should take place in a few weeks after all sides have had a chance to look through those documents and will reconvene. It's not over. What a day that was yesterday. Laura, thank you. So you we uh, always find ourselves often in these, <clears throat> the scrum of the media. Mm -hmm. And that, that was something else yesterday. With the rain coming down, the wind blowing sideways, and all those people falling all over each other on the steps. Not a nice day. Oh, not the place we want to be. All right, from California, Governor Jerry Brown speaking moments ago about his battle with the Trump administration. Administration on immigration. Here's what he said. It's time to just chill, uh, recognize the fact that they're here. Now, if Trump wants to round them up, you know, like some totalitarian government and ship them out, uh, say that. Well, California facing more pushback over its sanctuary state laws. What is next? Tennessee Congresswoman and Republican Senate candidate Marsha Blackburn is next. She's live. Plus, as Americans race to get their taxes sent in today, because today is tax day, President Trump is touting the strength of the economy and the new tax law. Reaction to all of this from our very own FBN's Charles Payne, live on set. You see what's happened to your wallet. I mean, you're getting a lot more money in your weekly or monthly checks than you ever thought possible. So people are really liking it, and very importantly, it's great for the country. We need a comprehensive immigration uh, with all the other talk and noise about the border. The fact is, America has uh, 10 to 11 million people that are here, and they're human beings, they have families. Uh, it's very important that they be integrated in a humane, intelligent way. But instead, it's just an inflammatory football uh, that very uh, uh, low-life politicians like to exploit. That was California Governor Jerry Brown a short time ago speaking in Washington, addressing his battle with the Trump administration on immigration. All of this coming as more and more California cities continue to fight back against the state's sanctuary city laws. The city council in Los Alamitos reaffirming a vote last night to exempt the city from that law. Joining us now, Tennessee Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, a Republican Senate candidate. Congresswoman, thank you for being here this morning. Good to be with you. Thanks. There's certainly a trend developing here, and I, and I want to yes. ask you about it. Are you seeing this growing anti-sanctuary city uh, sentiment growing across the state? We are seeing it grow across the country. And Sandra, here is why. When you allow sanctuary cities, first of all, it puts your citizens in peril and people know this. You can look at the crime stats. You can look at other stats that support this. Second thing is when you do this, when you have sanctuary city policies, you're allowing these sanctuaries to publicly flaunt and violate federal law, but you're doing nothing to hold them accountable. And the third thing is, uh, People are smart. Tennesseans are smart. And they know that when you allow a sanctuary city, basically you make every town a border town. And what they want to do is make certain that we abide by the rule mm. of law. We are a nation of laws. And they want that law to be upheld. They want their citizens to be safe. Uh, they don't want to make decisions that are going to run up the cost of law enforcement and crime. So I think you're going to see more 
cities hmm. across California up to out. Well, and we'll see where that goes. And meanwhile, the, the, the fight is ramping up this war of words between the California governor and our president. Yes. You just heard Jerry Brown speaking a few moments ago in D.C. Well, the president, just about one hour ago, hitting back on Twitter, uh, saying this, looks like Jerry Brown and California are not looking for safety and security along their very porous border. He cannot come to terms for the National Guard to patrol and protect the border. The high crime rate will only get higher much wanted wall in San Diego already started who is winning this fight congresswoman the president is winning this fight and the president is going to win this fight and the president is right about this and when you see how city governments are responding to the governor of California you know that they agree with President Trump and they disagree with Governor Brown and let me tell you something else Sandra when I talk to moms one of the number one things they talk about is the security and safety of their children and of their families and they know that the influx of of gangs, the influx of sex trafficking, the influx of drugs over that porous southern border makes their neighborhoods and communities less safe. Mm. So you're going to see security moms move forward in these 2018 elections and say, look, if there is a step the federal government can take to help secure mm. this country that thereby secures my neighborhood, I'm all for it. Just, and we hear that every single day. You know, following this vote, um, this Orange County city voting to opt out of California sanctuary yes. state laws, uh, the ACLU responded with a tweet uh, calling this a blatant violation of the city's obligation to follow a state law that puts our local resources to use for the safety of our communities rather than toward federal immigration agencies. Does this open does this open the city or these cities to lawsuits, Congresswoman? I don't think it does because they are complying with federal law. So obviously the ACLU is saying in this, they think that state law should preempt or trump, if you will, federal law. Now what would happen, how would the ACLU respond if there were to be sanctuary cities for tax evaders, sanctuary cities mm -hmm. for EPA violators, sanctuary cities for gangs? are sanctuary cities for drug traffickers. How would they respond to that? We are a nation of laws. We abide by the rule of law. The president is right on this issue. And that is why you are seeing growing support from city councils, from county commissions, and from citizens across the country that are saying illegal entry is wrong. Whether I wanna, it is. I, I want to finish up by asking you about the, the Senate race in your state of Tennessee. Yeah. I know Senator Bob Corker ultimately sent you a campaign contribution and, and wished you well. Uh, but we're looking at the latest polling in the state, Middle Tennessee State University, providing a poll, uh, the latest showing a 10 point lead by your Democratic opponent, Phil Bredesen. Uh, how is this race going, Congresswoman? Uh, it is going great. I'm standing on federal property, so I can't really discuss my race. I will tell you this. It is going great. We have great grassroots support, and we are heartened that the issues uh, that people really are focused on, uh, more tax cuts, uh, building that wall, supporting President Trump, and having good conservative mm -hmm constitutional Supreme Court justices. All right. Well, you know, there's a lot going on, and, and we appreciate you coming on this morning. And, Happy and good to be on with you. Congresswoman, thank you. Great moment during yesterday's Boston Marathon. American runner Desi Linden winning the women's race the first time since 1985. An American wo woman has won the Boston Marathon. It was not easy. They battled powerful wind and a cold rain, too. Get this. During the race, she actually slowed down, stopping to wait for a teammate who had to pick up another shirt or another jacket on the side. Despite that, she still won the race with DES on her front short and well If it was done. appropriate for me to there. stand and give her an ovation, I would. Uh -huh. I what do you will think? applaud her. Well done. Yeah, you follow well her? Executed. I mean, I do now. I knew about her. Uh -huh. um, but wow, what a shining moment there. Yeah, a, re a real machine. We're hoping she comes on America's News and we can talk about how she that did That would be fun. Cool stuff. Right, Five I'll years to the day of the bombing and all that weather wrapped in. So congratulations. Awesome.
Well, a stunning new cybersecurity alert this morning from top intelligence officials why warnings of Russia hacking attacks could put millions of Americans at risk. Also, the president's order of airstrikes in Syria sparking new legislation in the Senate over the use of American military force.